Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year! Good morning, Canvas Church. We're so glad you're joining us digitally today. A few times a year, we don't meet in person and give our worship team a little break. We hope that you're having a wonderful morning with your family. Happy 2023. If you're new with us, we hope that you'll join us in person next week, but if you're new with us today, we would love for you to fill out a connection card where you can just know a little bit about more about who we are and we can know a little bit more about how we can serve you. Um, you can find a digital connection card at campuschurch.org slash connect. Yeah, so we're virtual today, but next week we're back in person, so we look forward to seeing you then. But first, we want to invite you into our first worship uh, time here in 2023, so join us in worship. Revelation 5.13 says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Church, we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I pray that as we enter in 2023, that we truly make God the King of our hearts. We invite you into worship this morning with us. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. In our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious life forever seated high I believe in God Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And I
believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind because I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. We sing out, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows.
Hey, good morning, church. Hope you're having a really wonderful holiday. And um, hope you had a great Christmas and a great New Year's Eve and now a New Year's Day. We're mindful, even as I say that, we celebrate together and we mourn together. We're mindful of those of you for whom these holidays are difficult, um, especially those of us who miss folks, miss people, um, especially during the holidays. I want to talk just for a, a, a few moments about um, Psalm 93. We're working through the Psalms, and this is a really perfect Psalm for New Year's Day. But to understand or appreciate the Psalm, we have to spend just a moment um, trying to, in a small way, imagine um, what this Psalm might have meant for um, the Jews who sang it um, or who recited it and celebrated it together. So um, if, if we could, in our minds, could sort of go back to the Judges. Um, I don't know if you've ever read the book of Judges or how long ago it was that you did so, but if you have, um, then you know that um, the life of Israel, once they established themselves in Canaan, um, was very, um, uh, it was full of turmoil and a constant, they lived under constant threat of surrounding nations. Um, they did, Israel didn't have a king like the other, um, the other peoples of the land. And um, the book of Judges tells story after story after story in which Israel is threatened by the Amalekites and the Ammonites and the Kenites and the Philistines and the Midianites and on and on. It's a story after story in which um, the writer suggests that Israel um, fails to be faithful. And in this moment in which they fail to be faithful, they are threatened by the surrounding people groups. They don't have a king, and so they call upon a man or a woman um, to rise to the surface and become their leader. And in, 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 that, in that period of time, the leader for Israel, instead of being a king, is called a judge. Um, now I grew up learning that um, to criticize Israel um, both for their unfaithfulness during those days, but also for their desire to have a king. Um, and and we, would, we would say, we learned to say, and there's some truth to this, that they, they wanted to be just like the other people groups um, in the lands that they, sh that the, the people that they shared the land with. Um, but if you, read, if you read the judges and, and, and even before the judges and after the judges, and, um, you imagine what it was like to be um, a community of people constantly under threat, then may maybe we can find some sympathy for this desire to have a king, to have some kind of unifying um, someone or center of power um, so that we would feel like we're constantly up, down, up, down and, and um, lacking unity in the defense of our land. Um, well, Israel desires to have a king and um, if you read the scriptures, there's this, um, there's this moment in which God declares, in a sense, that he has been rejected. Because for Israel, God is their king. Just as for Egypt, Pharaoh is, is both a sort of a king and a god. Um, now, for Israel, Yahweh um, intends to be their king, their, their center of power, their, their unifying force. Um, so when the psalmist writes that God is our king, it carries a lot of weight with it. You know, it's all of these stories in which um, Israel felt insecure in the land and the stories in which Israel chooses a, a human king and, and, and the stories in which those human kings fail them. Last week we talked just a little bit about Herod and these, these um, human kings who accomplish certain things um, for, especially for those people who are in power. They, they accomplish certain things and they are sort of a presence of security, except that they're not because they're, they're violent human beings or they're power hungry. Um, so in Psalm 93, um, the psalmist declares in verse one, the Lord is king. Um, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. So what I want you to hear this morning, we're the, uh, applying this to entrance into a new year. Do you hear in that psalm um, the desire for um, uh, uh, strength and security and 
certainty. And, and the psalmist is declaring this is found in Yahweh. Israel declares, and we've had kings, we've had humans serve that role, but truly it is Yahweh who is our king. And the kingdom that Yahweh establishes is everlasting, the psalmist writes. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. This, this, if you compare this king to other kings, this king is he's robed in splendor and in majesty. He's girded in power. We're not talking just about horses and chariots and, and my army is bigger than your army. We're talking about um, the, the creator king. That you want to look at his kingdom, then look at the entire universe. This is the kingdom of our king. And the psalmist writes, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. It's interesting how often in, in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, but really throughout the scriptures, water is a part of the story. For Israel, you know, it's the sea that is so significant, um, the, the passing through the sea and the, and the psalms and the prophets who write about the wall of water or the parting of the water, this power of, of Yahweh the king. But this, this water that the psalmist is writing about in Psalm 93 is something more than just the sea and passing through the, through the sea, as if that, that wasn't enough for Israel, as if that wasn't enough of a demonstration of the power of our king. But this psalmist is writing about something a little different here, or something greater, something larger, when he writes, the floods have, this is verse 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their roaring. Verse 4, For more majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea, majestic on high is the Lord. With an exclamation point there. The waters that the psalmist is referring to in Psalm 93, I mean, maybe you could apply that to the sea and, and that, that Yahweh stands above the sea and is greater than the roar of the waves. But I think the psalmist is referring even to this, the waters in creation, God taming the sea. And, and we've talked before about this notion in ancient Israel that, that the sea contains something more than just water and danger. It it's, contains even beneath its waters evil. In creation, Yahweh has tamed these waters, has parted the waters from the land and shaped the earth to be um, a beautiful garden for humanity and has, with his own voice and with his own hands, created um, earth and animal and vegetation and human being. This is, this is the Lord our King. Um, and what I, what I want us to hear here, what I think those who those Israelites who recite this psalm here is the promise of security in this new day under the reign of our king. But I'll say that again because what I want us to do is make a shift to our own context, both communally and to, to you and to your own life, um, that the declaration that Yahweh is king is a declaration of security. Because this king has, you know, you want to talk about what this president did or that president did or what this person with great power or great wealth did or what that, what that woman with great power or great wealth did. But this king is the creator. This king has tamed the entire universe and shaped it to be his own. Um, the psalm ends with, in verse 5, your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. I want to suggest that um, there, there is a sense in our culture, and I personally feel it sometimes, when we make claims about God and about spirituality and about God's kingdom, there is this feeling, both among Christians and non-Christians, that we are... Um, Instead of diving into the difficulties of this world, we're separating ourselves from them. There's a criticism um, of this um, statement that sometimes we make, um, I'll be praying for you. 
or my thoughts and my prayers are with you. And there has been recently a call to action behind those words, that there's, a, there's an accusation that we just say those words and that they're empty, um, that they have no presence behind them. And I think that that's true sometimes for us, that we say those words and they don't have action behind them. They don't have presence. And sometimes that might be true also when we face the chaos and the turmoil and the difficulty that um, lie within this world and even within our own lives. And someone says, well, remember, God is king or God is in control or God is present. Um, And sometimes... I think that that feels like an escape from reality. But it doesn't have to be that way, does it? And this morning I want to present this psalm as um, a psalm that dives into reality. That, That it is true that there is action behind this claim. There's presence and force behind this claim. That in the midst of the brokenness and the chaos, both of this world and within your own life, God is king. The Lord is king. And there is absolute presence and power in that statement. That this isn't some far away or futuristic claim or even ancient claim, but it is present now. That I'm learning, I'm learning just personally in my own life right now to appreciate this truth um, and to even recite it that you are present, Father. Um, you, you, you're present here, and you care, and you are all-powerful. The psalmist declares, the Lord is king, and this means something in the present. Well, um, the, the rabbinic sources say that the Levitical choirs would sing this psalm, Psalm 93, every Friday evening, leading into Sabbath. Let's think about that for a moment, that this psalm um, carries this weight behind it, that as we enter into, as we leave, in a sense, as we, as we leave our work behind, and think about what our work represents. It's so, in so many ways, it is part of our identity. As we leave our work behind and enter into Sabbath, And Sabbath being this promise of peace and rest in, in, for the Christian, in Christ our King. As we enter into this space, feel the anxiety of leaving behind all of the troubles, all of the undone work, all of the, all of the um, things that uh, that, that, that people rely on me to accomplish, uh, that people rely on you to do as we leave that behind and enter into Sabbath with discipline because it's so hard to leave our work behind and rest in the presence of Christ our King. In fact, I'm, I'm claiming it's so hard that most of us don't ever do it. We don't have within our tradition a true observance of Sabbath. And I, I don't think many of us ever leave behind um, all of those things that depend on us. As we, as we imagine leaving all of that behind and entering into space in which we claim Christ is King. The Lord our God is King, and this God is in control of all things. Not, not, cre- not making all things, not making all of the trouble that we experience, but is present and is powerful and can care for us and wants to care for us. Well, there's also a tradition, one of the reasons I chose this psalm um, for this day, is there's this um, tradition or this thought that, um, that this, wa- this is an enthronement psalm, meaning um, the, the, the Israel would recite this and remind themselves that God sits upon the throne. And, and there's a, there's a, there's a um, claim by some that this psalm was not only recited each evening leading into Sabbath, but it was also um, recited in an enthronement celebration at the beginning of every new year, which would become Rosh Hashanah for um, the Jews. 
But at the beginning of the new year, um, this psalm was recited. And Israel is reminded leading into this new year. And now you and I are reminded leading into this new year in 2023 that God is king. And we say this not as an escape from our world, but as people who are fully present in our world, desiring to be a blessing and relying on this truth to be true, to be really true, to be actively true, that God is king and that God is present and God is enthroned and enrobed in majesty and that God covers above the waters and speaks peace into them and creates and, and all of those things that we believe about God our King. Well, this morning I want to invite you to the table of the Lord. Um, I always, you know, I, I prefer to be, you know, present with, with one another at the table, to get up out of the pew and walk to the table together, to put arms around each other, to say, I love to say to people, I'm, I'm thankful to take the supper with you. We don't get to do that today, but hopefully you're with family or friends this morning as you um, have, have joined us in worship online. And I want to invite you to the table together. And it, it's okay if you don't have, um, you know, the, the bread and, and, and the wine or the juice, um, you know, make do with whatever you've got. The point of the, the communion table is the communion together. And so I invite you to come to the table this morning with this declaration. You're coming to the table for the first time in 2023. And the table we've talked about so often is so important to us. I'm inviting you to come to the table with this declaration that Christ is king, that Christ is king over the table, that Christ is king over our lives. We invite Christ again to reign over us and to make a difference in our lives and in this world and to bring peace into our lives and into this world. We claim Christ is King and we mean it for real. We mean it as something fully present in our lives and in this world. I love you, church, and I look forward to seeing you next week and celebrating with you at the table. Let's pray together and we'll be done. God, thank you for the table that we share. It's become so important to us at campus. We're thankful that you made it something so significant for us. We pray that um, you will reign over us and that you will reign in us and that in our lives and through our lives, you'll create peace in this world. Amen.